Welcome, everyone. It's Angelo Robles, and welcome to Family Office TV. I'm also the founder at SFO Continuity, a private membership club, and Family Office Masterclass. As many of you now know, this whole week, I'm in wonderful Vienna, Austria. It's such a pleasure to be here, meeting such amazing people, including our special guest today. We are gonna have an incredibly well-rounded discussion with someone who's really immersed in Europe, global family offices, and that would be the fine gentleman to my left here, Marcus Schwinnagel. Thank you so much for joining us today, Marcus. Thanks a lot. It's Thanks such a pleasure. Lot. Well, why don't we start? Tell us a little bit about your background and what do you do? Okay, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I have been for 20 years in the industry. I'm qualified to practice in Switzerland, Liechtenstein, and Austria. And what I mainly do is I build wealth management ecosystem for my clients. Excellent. So, of course, on that open, you didn't mention necessarily family continuity and governance. So I'm going to start with that. <laughs> I've always said the greatest threat to the family, and my investor friends just poo-poo it, but the greatest threat to the family is the family. Part of that relates to governance, how decisions are made. You're deeply experienced, not just in the three countries you noted and your heritage, but having clientele around the world. What is the greatest threat to family continuity? I would say it's conflict uh, out of the family. So um, I rarely saw in my career that family wealth was uh, um, in danger due to um, investment management because it has been poorly done. But I saw it regularly that there is a danger for the family itself, for the continuity, and also for family wealth. And this all goes back to conflict. You mentioned conflict twice defining a challenge that's very specific. How do you define conflict in a family? I would say it's lack of trust. So if there is not enough of communication within uh, the family and there is not a transparent decision making, which by the way are the two main pillars of family governance, then you have an issue most probably within the family that then can also have repercussions on their wealth uh, continuity. I agree with you, but to take a little bit of the other side of the coin, I'm going to quote, I believe I have it right with Warren Buffett. I believe in an investment committee that is an odd number and it's less than three. There is a simplicity to we're a small family unit. I created the wealth. I can make quick decisions. I've proven to be highly successful and I'm doing what's in the best interest of, let's broadly call it either individually or together with my spouse for the benefit of our child, our children, and our grandchildren. Is top-down governance really that bad? I would say that uh, we don't have enough experience to, uh, to see whether it works for many generations. Most probably for one generation it, uh, it could work if, uh, let's say, the, the top level is, is strong enough and, and committed enough to uphold such a governance type. Um, but I would say, since we're talking about continuity, we need to think in generations. And it, it's my personal conviction that it would be quite difficult to uphold such a, a system in, in the long run. Because sooner or later, you may run into a, a generation that is saying, we will not play by these rules. And I'm assuming even if a family, no matter what kind of governance they have, especially probably top down, if it's not being complied with, either strangely enough by the one that's enforcing it, the quote unquote the elders, but obviously a rising generation as well. And from my experience, inevitably, maybe not the first time, the first generation, but by the second generation, that level of top down decision making, no matter what I just said five minutes ago, I just don't see it working long term. Have could you remember a multi-generational family in the countries that you noted that go more than three generations that are driven by effectively the dictator model of governance? There might be some. No, um, I would say in particular the European examples, they are based on values and uh, their, their values uh, very often are different than just like top down. So, 
the, the continuity evolved for, for such uh, families. And what we see in, in Europe, some business families, they, they have really nice visions and also missions. For instance, there is one family in Germany, it's called the Zinkan and Miele family. They produce uh, electronic devices. And they say, our wealth is just a loan from future generations. So and <laughs> if, you, if you let that think for a moment, our wealth is a loan from future generations. So this involves stewardship. This involves also purpose. And I take it that it also involves culture to a certain extent. So it's rather an inclusive uh, governance uh, model than know the right attribute than an imperative uh, governance model. I agree, but I'm going to, again, to have the audience feel like they're interactive and take a little bit of the other approach for a second. And I learned this from one of the Sage family office people in the industry. His name is Charles Lowenhall, who's an American, but is incredibly active in Asia and in Australia. And he has a saying, and I may get it a little wrong, it basically is, the word stewardship is very onerous. It almost implies that I'm so-called inheriting the money, and now it's a being a steward, unless it's something you specifically want to be, a steward of an art museum, whatever, it does sound like it's probably not a labor of love. How do you engage the rising generation that may not be the wealth creator that the wealth creator is? How do you have them feel involved without having the onerous, as we would say in the U.S., of being the word a steward or stewardship? I think your, your question simply shows us how important values are in this context. So when I was saying the main two pillars, so communication and decision-making of a, of a governance system, um, that are two, two elements, but the foundation should be shared values. So shared values within, within the family, that obviously leads to a purpose, and then we talk about culture. And once you have shared values, purpose, and culture, I, I think you, you could even then, if that is the family DNA, you could even transmit then stewardship of, uh, of wealth, even if that means a humble life for very wealthy family members. There are some families that will say our wealth is our purpose. Until they run into a generation where wealth has no meaning for them. So this, this could have worked for, I don't know, even for the last few centuries. That, uh, that <laughs> That's how Europeans think in centuries. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the, the next generation, they, they may say we are not interested in, in, in wealth. Look just the current generation, Gen, Gen Z, um, how corporates are struggling to attract them. You cannot attract them with, with a bonus, with, with, large, with large salaries, I don't know, with, uh, with a card that you, that you give to them. They, they will not, or not even titles, they will not be interested. They look for purpose. So, and that's a huge issue that the, the entire industry currently, currently has. And I think it's similar in, in, in family wealth. So those families that um, just derive their purpose from, from wealth, they, well, they have been lucky over, I don't know, over the past generations, but mm -hmm. they are running a huge risk. How could I say this being respectful to a rising generation? And I could relate to them, and I have a rising generation in my family with my son. Suppose in certain circumstances, being a wealth creator and an elder, I make a decision that I created the wealth, I want to have family continuity. So I want my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren to benefit. Should I hold my heirs, my rising generation, to a degree of competency? How do I, do I have an obligation to make sure they're competent? It's a, it's a difficult uh, question, uh, and 
I would separate here family continuity and wealth continuity. So um, a family member can perfectly contri contribute to the family continuity by, by being a lovely person, by inspiring uh, others, but they may be terrible when, when it comes to, to wealth. So I, I think I would separate the, the, two, the two issues. And what I would most probably do is have a specific focus in all circumstances on, on wealth structuring. So sometimes you, you need to uh, structure ownership also to protect further, further generations. Excellent. And uh, for the, our audience that will watch this digitally, we do have an intimate audience that is live with us today. We are encouraging them if they have any questions to feel free to ask. I'll probably repeat it because I have a microphone. It'll be easier to pick up. But trust me, a lot of people have much better questions than I do. But I, I gave you some tough ones there. Uh, but you did a great job. And I agree with you, by the way, even when it sounded like I was going a little back and forth, this is the reality that we face as advisors to family and family offices. It's context and explaining it is very, very important. Audiences love stories. Do you have any, as we put perhaps a bow on governance, do you have any stories that would hit home to people in any experiences that you've had mm -hmm. that, that you could share? I, I would say that one specific um, case and, and um, setup for a family that resonated a, lo uh, a lot with me. So a client approached me and asked me for a family constitution. And, and I said, look, I, I really don't want to write a family constitution. And, and then he said, why not? Should be fun legal work. And, and I said, no, it's not fun legal work because <laughs> I think it could not resonate. You know, like constitutions, we, we all know our constitutional rights. So everyone knows uh, it's my right under, under the constitution, but no one knows the duties under, under a constitution. So this is exactly, what, uh, what you would, uh, would achieve. And there was a, a discussion with other experts uh, involved and, and that client changed completely. And, and we, during the process, we, we it, it was, I, I think also for, for, for the client himself was like really cathartic, you know, leaving a lot of, uh, of things behind that he was maybe taking from, from his parents or, or grandparents. And, and he opened to a completely different world in seeing things much more decentralized and, and seeing wealth in a much bigger perspective and also leaving ego behind. So I think this is not about, at the end, at the beginning, it was all about him. And at the end, it was just about the family. And, and it, it changed completely his, uh, his perception. So and the, and that was for the for the entire team. Um, I mean, it took us a lot of uh, of discussions, uh, but the the outcome was just yeah, fantastic for for everyone. That's an excellent story. And for the context to the audience, governance is very very important. Family continuity is probably at the heart of what I do and what Marcus does. Although different, there's some synergies that we share. But the conversation today is really broadly about families of wealth and single family offices. And it is going to cover a variety of different topics, including as we transition right now. Me and Marcus may be the only people in the world. I'm sorry, everyone. We do have an audience question. Please. Thank you. Um, Marcus, I would like to ask you, how do you create uh, this family interaction that can also then be integrated by a constitution because the one is not against the other but it is just uh, a sort of a travel towards this harmony of the family and also sort of a, a, a big brand that uh, where you can recognize this family itself excellent I love the question. Thanks a lot uh, for, for that one. So um, I, 
I believe a lot in, in narrative. Um, I, as I said, I, I have rather low conviction when it comes to, to constitutions because a narrative often helps people to, to relate to the hero, you know, and, and, and I mean, this is, I just went with my son uh, to a Disney movie uh, recently, so there, and it's, you, you relate to, to the hero and it transfers something, it transfers their why and how, and why and how are super easily transferable <laughs> if it's within a narrative, so if you, if you have the, the story and and look, in every family there is, I don't know, an uncle or someone who did something really specific and, and this can help in particular a younger generation, it can help them uh, a lot. And within the narrative you, you can still have strong points on, on the values and, and on why are we doing things in a specific way. and, and in, and in the first place also how are we do, doing uh, things and the the narrative then really helps to 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 explain this to to everybody excellent you could censure not only your passion but your knowledge about really i think the most important subject for families of great wealth we're now going to segue a little bit into a subject that you and i love i don't know if it's going to lose the audience so quick we'll find out but it's very, very important, and I would say probably nine out of 10 families, as they often mess up in governance, just being honest, they mess up in this one too. And that is gonna be the structuring of a family office. Now for my US audience, there are nuances in the US with lender versus the IRS, we've covered it before, but there's gonna be some crossover to what Marcus will mention now in a couple of my follow-up questions. But do understand, each country is different. We're being a little broad and focus somewhat on Marcus's experience in Austria, uh, Germany, and Switzerland, and Liechtenstein. Uh, so on that note, when I look at it to simplify it, you have the assets in, let's call it one bucket of ownership and control, and you have the single family office, AKA management company in the US, could be a C Corp, could be an LLC, in Switzerland, it'd be one of the forms of a corporation. How do they act separately and should they and cantons in Switzerland for taxation? And then how do they begin to intertwine? I mean, from, from a legal perspective, um, when you look at uh, most European jurisdictions, it's most probably advisable to separate the family office from the wealth ownership structures. Mm -hmm. So um, to, to mix the two would not be a good idea from a tax perspective, but, but also with our inheritance uh, laws, you, you could run into, into many issues. So uh, usually when, when I advise uh, clients, I tell them opt for a clear separation between uh, the two. Specifically, you know, um, you may not need the family office at one point in time anymore because you have other options, uh, things change, but you, what you will always need is your ownership uh, structure. So I don't know how it is in the, in the US. I know that from, for tax purposes, you, you sometimes see, see a mix. Um, I, I'm, from a European um, perspective, I would never advocate for it, same as I would never um, advocate for, a, for an integrated family office into the family business. So have it, what, what is a single family office? At the end, it's a wealth management services entity. So treat it as such and don't mix it with, with a wealth ownership uh, entity or even with, with a family business. So I would strictly, strictly separate it. Does the concept of a corporation, a management company, AKA the single family office in Switzerland and or some of the other countries you have experience in, does it have to be perhaps for tax advantages, a for-profit entity? Oh uh, no, it, it, it doesn't need to be. You, you would also find uh, other, um, other vehicles that you, that you could could use the, the issue is, is simply uh, that in particular in cross-border scenarios you, you run the risk that one of the countries involved then uh, would apply a sp uh, specific taxation. So right. 
and, and that, that makes it a little bit difficult to, um, to have it completely tax exempt. And how about areas related to structuring and corporations, again, assets? And by the way, that could get very complicated because the assets may be 50 different real estate holdings and different LLCs or corporations, LP interest. It's off at various trusts. It's not as simple as just one entity. It's complicated. But how, so if the entity that manages the money, the family office, especially if it was a for-profit, but it must have agreements with the entity or trust that controls the assets that it's getting paid, whether it's a carry, whether it's a two and 20, like a hedge fund or an LP interest, is that a, what we would call in the US, is that some level of science, but a lot of art, it depends on the situation and the skill of their practitioner helping to set it up. I, I have another strong view here. When, when I discuss setups with, um, with my clients, I would never recommend that uh, a single family office performs investment management. And that, there's a simple reason. If I have external asset managers and they don't perform, I can replace them. In the single family office, if you would want to replace your investment team, this would be, become rather, rather expensive. So always in, in practical terms, you know, it, it may sound fancy. We do our own investment management. Very often, just by buying a, a team, an investment team, it doesn't mean that you will achieve uh, performance. And very often, we also have to keep in mind that um, the families behind a family office are not investment professionals. So they are not, I would say, fit and proper, you know, to, to run uh, a financial institution, even if it's just a financial institution with one client, with one, with one family. But it's, I think it's, it's very difficult for, for them sometimes to, to understand what it, uh, what it means, and it gets much easier if it's a service entity. Okay, now we're going to go a little back and forth on this one. I hear you. And by the way, that we would call that in the U.S., that is definitely a hot take. That means it's different, it's contrarian. And I like it, because I like contrarian. But what I could argue is you're making the assumption that the outside forces that are managing the capital are somehow good or very good or great. By the law of mathematics and the nature of large numbers, they're probably average. But of course, the family who's very smart and has a lot of money doesn't do average. So everything they touch, they think, is gonna be good or great. If that's the case, wouldn't they want to have the greatest control and privacy and customization by bringing, having the right structure, bringing on the right team, and again, having the control and customization that they can't perfectly get if they outsource that? Okay. Let me please be more, more precise on, on the, the concept and, and my conviction. I think uh, as a single family office, you, you need three core capabilities. The first one is strategic asset allocation, so that you have a strategy across all asset classes. That comes with an institutionalized process, so how you select manager, how, how, you, how the entire process is performed. The, the second capability is monitoring and risk management. So you want to understand what your investment strategy is, is doing in terms of risks. How much of risk do you want to, t uh, to take for which return? And what you then need is financial accounting and reporting. With that, you get a single source of truth. You get control over the data. That goes back into your institutional investment committee and then again into your process. So you don't need any investment management or asset management capabilities because that you can completely outsource to the best uh, providers in, in the industry. And if they don't perform, you change them. Where you make the difference in my experience, mm -hmm. at least, is at the level of the strategic asset allocation. And I am gonna to look to the audience to see if they have any questions, because that was some pretty integral things on structuring and how it intertwines with a different perspective than most that Marcus has. Any questions, anyone? So far, so good? All right. One, perhaps, final question on structuring. Given the countries that you have a core focus on, 
what are some of the nuances of advantages? I think we're going to be, because I talk about Switzerland a lot, my audience knows, broadly, I'm an advocate, nothing's perfect, but I'm starting to hear more about Liechtenstein, and I'm not sure why. Is it a tax advantage that cantons in Switzerland, that maybe they, there's something unique in Liechtenstein that's better, or perhaps I'm underestimating Austria where I am now in Germany. I wouldn't say how would you rank them, but I'm tempted to. But what are some of the nuances and differences? Mm -hmm. So what Liechtenstein is quite unique as a country. So has an S&P <laughs> triple, triple A rating, has, uh, has no public debt. So it's one of the richest countries uh, in the world. And from a structuring perspective, they have a few interesting vehicles. One is uh, the Liechtenstein Foundation. Right. Austria has something, something similar, but the Liechtenstein as framework is much more liberal. And uh, you, you also achieve very nice, you can very nicely achieve asset protection, and it can also be tax, uh, tax efficient. Why there is growing interest uh, recently in the foundations, uh, I think it has to do uh, a little bit with the blockchain industry, because if you look into the blockchain <laughs> industry, every second setup is structured with, uh, with a foundation, so even um, large protocols like the Ethereum protocol. And the younger generation, uh, young entrepreneurs out of the tech space that are currently the biggest wealth contributors actually, so technology, they, they became familiar with the, with the tool and, and they said, hey, it works well in, in our business setups. Why should we not use it for, for private wealth uh, ownership structuring? And I probably would be remiss if I didn't bring up, there is the uniqueness of the cantons in Switzerland. I could argue they probably compete potentially for wealthy families, for business, and they could vary widely relative to the taxation where Zurich, the canton that's in, versus one that may be half an hour away and is far more tax favorable. How do you go about deciding which canton is going to be best? Mm -hmm. So that is more um, a question of where do you book so one, the first question we had is, is more how and where do you own? Which vehicle is on top? Could right. be a trust, could be, could be a, a, a foundation. So the Liechtenstein is, is um, fantastic um, for, for European uh, families, but I also see more interest now out of the, of the US. Um, but still, I, I would book most probably the assets then in, uh, in Switzerland. So if you hold bankable assets under a structure, I, I, would, wa uh, I would most probably advise my clients do that in, um, in, in Switzerland because the, the wealth management ecosystem yeah, is much bigger is, uh, sure. and is, is, is can, can cater to many more needs. And Marcus, by the way, everyone is incredibly knowledgeable. We're covering a lot of subjects. He's handling them as always incredible. But these are subjects individually that I could do two hours on. So yes, there are certain nuances of the countries, of various trust, of the intertwining, and of private trust companies that we're probably going to have to save until we focus for one of my multi-hour interviews digitally. But I'm trying to keep this one a little bit free-flowing. Let's talk a little bit. You covered it to a degree. But the actual family office itself, so this will be my question for you. If the greatest threat to the family that we appear to agree on is the family, how come there's no one dedicated in the family office 100% or near 100% to the family? There will be governance thought leaders like Christian Stewart, uh, Matt Wesley, Jay Hughes. I wouldn't put myself in their category, but I've spoken about this as well, that there needs to be a chief continuity officer. Some people call it a chief learning officer. How come that hasn't really taken off? I, I think w what's nice, Angelo, we, we already covered 
two essential areas when it comes to family and family wealth continuity. So it's on one hand family governance, on the other hand family um, wealth ownership uh, structuring. And now the third um, element that, that you would need is a wealth management ecosystem. Um, so that can be can be service providers together, can be uh, a multi-family office, uh, and if you are uh, on top of things, then it can be uh, a single family office. I would say that there is some change in the industry, but still, you know, these are very difficult and intimate uh, discussions. How are we going to deal with, uh, with family governance? How do we perform? estate planning, what is going to happen our our lifetime. So uh, I would say that uh, single family offices found it a little bit difficult to, to get into, into the space, although they would be ideally positioned. So they, they could act as governance facilitators on, on one mm -hmm. hand, and they could, could also assist in, in uh, ownership uh, structuring where you need to discuss estate planning. You need to discuss what happens when a certain generation or certain people will not be around uh, anymore. So I think that COVID has changed things a little bit. So there, there was more, more awareness, but let's see what, what the future is going, going to bring. I personally think a single family office can be ideally or is ideally positioned between governance and wealth ownership uh, structuring to assist the, the family by acting as a governance facilitator mm -hmm. and also by uh, focusing on the most important topics when it comes to ownership, which is estate planning. Of course, I completely agree. Now, ironically, my next subject would also make it into that, and that is gonna be risk. We are living, I'm sure everyone will agree, in very turbulent times. We have issues with war going on in multiple spots around the world. Uh, since COVID, there's been massive deficits in countries, including the US. I could argue there's a level of civil unrest in the US and around the world from a variety of different perspectives. These are, if a family cares about continuity in the family, these are turbulent times. How do they address issues around risk what should they be concerned about? And I'm, I'm giving you a three-pronged question, it's unfair. How could they help to mitigate some of those risks? Mm -hmm. So the best risk mitigator is awareness in the first place. So they need to become aware of what risks they, they are running. And that could be in, in all kinds of spaces. What I see very often is diversification. So that families, they, they often have a home bias, they are just invested in their own jurisdiction, they are the nationals of, uh, of that uh, place, they have the structures in, in that place. So you, if in that place something is going to happen, you run a risk. So they, you need to be aware and then think, okay, what can we do? What can we, what can we add? Uh, the second uh, thing I would want to mention here, you cannot stress test enough. So if you approach uh, family continuity and wealth ownership over, over generations, you, you need to think in scenarios. And it's not sufficient that maybe your lawyer comes with, uh, with, the, with a list. No, you need to get all kinds of people on the, on the table and you, you need to brainstorm, I don't know, maybe for days or, or, or weeks where you think in scenarios. In the U.S., in the military parlance, we would call that red teaming. Uh, there's other verbiage, too. You partially answered it, but I think that's a very important subject. When you're too close to it as a family or even the family office, you sometimes overlook. You have blind spots. We all do. Everyone has blind spots. Arguably, the perception of our ego and, of course, what we're doing is perfect may also get in the way. How do you know how to bring in outside resources to help you understand there's risk, and then it comes down to probability versus the impact. If something has a 10% chance of happening, but the impact is beyond minimal, okay, no big deal. But if something has a two or 3% chance of happening, but the impact could be devastating, that 
needs to be, you need to be aware of it and at least have a plan in place to mitigate it. How do you go about bringing in outside sources to understand and mitigate risk? I sometimes bring in quite um, people from, from the investment management side that have a rather pessimistic view, <laughs> so that are rather do me on, on, on that end. Um, and let families have a conversation with them and then immediately afterwards something someone who, who can add something more positive for instance uh, uh, someone that, that is currently advising a family that went through hard times and still made it so and and then it starts you know lessons learned mm -hmm. with warning and you you get into a, a mix where brainstorming starts and that's the most important thing that that wealth owners themselves we we are as advisors yes we can give them checklists but m most probably we didn't go through everything we we maybe we don't have the the experience personally so the more diverse their their input is from from various angles the the more they they can benefit and as i said once you you are aware of the risks then um, to, to find solutions is, is then not that tricky tricky anymore. The, the tricky part is, is the awareness. I say this about Americans in the U.S. that we need to think more globally. We need to have trust, foundations, resources, passports diversified around the world. Right now, the vast majority of American families are U.S. only in their passport and dollar denominated, which is kind of hard to get away from. But I never thought about it from the other perspective. When you're talking with families in Germany and Italy and Liechtenstein and in Switzerland, wherever, outside of the U.S., do you also talk about they need to be more diversified, including their passports and relationships? Or outside of the U.S., is that automatically assumed that things could go wrong and we need diversity? With European families you would rarely see the need that they say I don't know someone German says now I also want an, an Austrian uh, passport because for for Europeans we it's we have this uh, we have free movement within the the, the European uh, Union not only of people but also of capital and it's so within people so people have absorbed the the principle that most probably they would not think uh, to get a U.S. passport uh, to to diversify, and it's also well that that would tie them into the U.S. tax system. Yeah, that, so that's would, probably the biggest. Exactly, actually. you you would not <laughs> do that, and I don't know if I would see the benefit uh, of a Caribbean passport for 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 a European uh, family because on, I mean the, the the really interesting passports that uh, that people are across the globe want want to have are the European ones. It's interesting, because I didn't know that was going to be Marcus's response, and it's very insightful. So my perception about the U.S. markets in terms of families and not diversifying enough, it's kind of pretty similar. But you do bring up some good points in Europe. So apparently, I think this is a weakness of families in both Europe and the U.S., but not the subject to do a deep dive in today. Uh, maybe my final question, what are some future trends and or challenges that you see on the horizon for family offices? With regard to trends, I see more decentralized uh, setups. So I'm uh, currently also uh, doing some, some research with, uh, with some other experts, how could the governance look in the future in a more decentralized uh, way? So could this become um, like a DAO, so a decentralized Very autonomous uh, organization on the blockchain? Not so much because I think blockchain will solve uh, everything, but um, it's more it could create uh, additional engagement, and that's that's very very important. So I think that's on on the organizational um, part, on the wealth ownership part to stay with blockchain. I believe a lot in tokenization. So we will we will see 
quite substantial uh, evolvements uh, there. So, for instance, and, and I'm, for instance, with NFTs, and I'm not talking about uh, crypto punks or or bought apes, but I'm I'm talking important real uh, world cases. For instance, uh, tokenizing uh, an art collection. So this is a fantastic way where you can use a token as a container where you can put rights to to the uh, to an artwork into the container but you can also put information so just imagine if you have a large art collection you have a library of pa of paperwork mm -hmm. that's that's the pain point of uh, of owning uh, of owning art so you could all transfer that to the to the blockchain you could transfer ownership title there you could book the token with a Swiss or Liechtenstein bank when, and you have it in secure custody. Obviously, there are also specific storing options if you, if you would want to have it. And if you would want to trade then or to, to sell um, a piece of uh, or an artwork, you, you could do that within the bank by transferring the, the token. And I, I think that's, that's quite an exciting um, trend in, in the industry and obviously will, will have an impact also when it comes to family offices. And the third point um, that, I, that I see is um, that there is more globalization in terms of uh, investments so that families are aware, in particular in, in Europe, we, yeah, we, have, uh, we have some areas that are quite close to, to Europe, so I think that also motivated people to think more, more globally also when it comes to their, to their investments and, and to their investment activities. You did give me an idea, Marcus, so you're going to get one more question. It's going to be an easy one, but I have to comment a little bit on what you said because I didn't expect that direction. My audience, more so from probably two years ago, I could almost see them saying, oh no, never bring up to Angelo crypto or NFTs. They're probably going like this. I did a lot of programming, way more than anyone else in the family office community on crypto, including interviewing Michael Saylor and other prominent figures. It was incredible until it wasn't. So I looked like a genius when the market's going up and maybe not so much when it was going down. To my credit, I did put my money where my mouth was and that final year and a half in crypto was not so kind overall. But I will say exactly what you said. The technology in blockchain and NFTs, yes, I'm gonna say that word that I haven't said in probably two years, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, and the promise of fractional ownership of assets and hard assets, it, there's something there. We haven't perfectly figured it out yet, there's nuances behind it that could lead me into central bank digital currencies and things like that. We'll save that discussion for a different time. But to put your head in the sand and assume that that was an era, it was wrong, there was nothing good that came from it is completely wrong. NFTs is digital art, yeah, that appears to be an issue. <laughs> but the other value behind NFTs and blockchain, it still is worthy of understanding and consideration. My final question was when you mentioned NFTs, I thought about art and I'm in Europe and I'm in the hotbed of Austria and, and again, Liechtenstein, Germany and Switzerland. Art means something. When I talk to old world families, there's three assets they always talk to me about. Of course, I'm gonna leave you hanging on those three assets. It's land, hundreds of years, it's art and it's gold. So you're really in it in Switzerland. Are those three assets that you hear families that literally go back multiple generations and a little extra emphasis on art, please? Mm -hmm. So what I see is, or what I have discussions with, with clients since now one and a half years is uh, how can we uh, increase our exposure to gold? That's the first one, and then how should we own gold? Ah, great so question. Not, not via, via an ETF uh, <laughs> no. uh, where, where someone promises you to, to deliver then uh, gold, which most probably is not going okay, to Okay, but do you trust putting all your gold in a bank? No, I would not put it in a, in a bank. Uh, I, 
maybe a part, uh, but uh, otherwise we we have so many custody solutions in in Switzerland. Exactly. You, you can you can even do that on top of the Alps. You you can store your your <laughs> literally and, yes. and you <laughs> you will have guaranteed access. So. Um, what I what I see with with in discussions with with my clients, they want access or they want to invest in gold that is available if uh, uh, if there there is any any significant crisis. So that's that's the first one. The the second one, art. Um, as I mentioned, I, I see quite some traction on uh, and interest in in blockchain, not so much as an investment, but really for ownership. So what what we discussed before, NFTs as an ownership um, vehicle for for a specific uh, piece of art, and the the token as a container and. Uh, what is nice in, in Switzerland and Liechtenstein together, we have the so-called Crypto Valley. So we have 6,000 people working in, in the industry. Wow, that much. And people are very often, they, are, they have been in wealth management before, so they know what wealth, um, they know a little bit about um, wealth management and now they, they bring it to, to the blockchain and we will, we will see very interesting uh, solutions in, in the future. And art, the solution is already there. Excellent. When I talk to the multi-generation European families, and they almost all mention those three, it's not the same in the US. I don't hear that level of, you gotta own literal gold, you gotta own art. Real estate, a little bit more common, but there's a land and maybe a farmland emphasis, and I wonder if that relates to European families that go back generations, what are things that could have went wrong? I could think of the English Reformation, 1620s, French Revolution, Russian Revolution, Nazi Germany. There's things that go wrong. What happens to the wealthy that are maybe not the all-powerful at that time? Uh, they're no longer all wealthy. You could look into that, whether they're eliminated, uh, whether it simply is taken from them. And I can make the argument maybe a little harder with gold. But with art and with land, it's possible with proper titling, structures, and documentation, you have a fighting chance of some point in the future getting back. I admit gold and land would also be hard to take with you. You'll be surprised how you could roll up art, but we could save that for a little bit of another time. Marcus, you are a wealth of knowledge, and we really just touched the surface today. For those that would like to reach out and learn more, how they can connect with you and your firm. Oh, they can find me on LinkedIn. I'm quite active on, on LinkedIn. And otherwise, uh, my law firm is called Central Law in Switzerland. So they'll, they'll find me by just Googling it. And if you don't mind, Marcus, if you could spell, and you're Marcus with a K, if you could spell your last name. <laughs> it's, <laughs> American <laughs> audience, listen up. S-C-H-W-I-N-G-S-H-A-C-K-L. <laughs> Thank you. And I hope, I hope you all appreciate having a great guest like Marcus on. And by the way, if you missed out how to connect with him on DM, on email, I could keep it real simple. Just reach out to me, and I'm happy to make a connection to Marcus. It doesn't matter if you're in the U.S., if you're somewhere around the world, if you're here where I am now in Austria. Like, you have to know someone like him. Like, he's a value to your family office and your family. Like, stop thinking you could all do this alone. You can't. We all have blind spots. We're imperfect. Having smart people who are talented in your network, and yeah, they probably deserve to get paid as well, provide value back to you. Everyone, in my conclusion, I really am enjoying my trip here in Austria, meeting some amazing people, and more importantly for me, learning so much. They have a lot to teach me, which they're doing, and I'm loving it. It really has been a great experience. I hope you're enjoying the output and the work that I do at Family Office TV. Please follow me on social media, including my YouTube and LinkedIn. I could be reached at angelorobles.com, and my email will be there. And my core focus on what I do, and I've been in this community for decades, I'm completely dedicated to the single family office community, bringing more intellectual rigor 
deeper conversations that are more than just the U.S. or just Europe, but more global in their perspective, and really focused on best practices for single-family offices. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Have a great day. And Marcus, thank you for being a great Thanks guest. A lot, Angelo. My pleasure. Thank my you. Pleasure.